This morning I have a question, particularly for our first communion kids. Now this is not a question, I'm not going to quiz you about the faith or what you learned in your classes, but I'm going to ask you a very important question. Are you ready for this? How many of you five have ever been fishing before? Raise your hand if you've ever been fishing. Okay, almost all of you have been fishing before. All right, that's good news. Now, of those who have been fishing before, have any of you ever caught 153 fish in one day? No, Nathaniel, how about you? No, Elena? No, nobody's ever caught that many fish, and yet that's what we're hearing about in today's story, the gospel story. Can you imagine 153 large fish in one single catch? That's pretty amazing. Is it, that's not amazing enough. This gospel story is a great gift to us because in it is not just a great catch of fish for those who are fishermen, but also in it is an encounter with Jesus. An encounter with Jesus. How many of the First Communion kids would like to have an encounter with Jesus? Would any of you like to do that? Yeah, I hope all of your hands are in the air because you're getting ready to have an encounter with Jesus in just a few minutes as you receive His body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now, I can't help but ask the whole congregation then, how many of you like to go fishing? All right, we've got a lot of people. How many of you have caught 153 fish in one catch? Well, are you sure? Do we need to go to confession? All right. <laughs> extraordinary if we caught 153 fish in one catch. And how many of you in the congregation would like to have an encounter with Jesus? I hope all your hands are in the air now because we all desire that in the heart of hearts, the depth of our being, to have an encounter with Jesus himself. Jesus gave the apostles an encounter with himself for now the third time. Remember that they were hiding in the upper room after his death and resurrection, and he comes to the upper room twice to encounter them. And now they have gone back to kind of their normal day of everyday lives to the seashore of Galilee, to the Sea of Tiberias, and they are fishing. And he reveals himself to them once again. This is such a powerful encounter because it is an encounter with the risen Lord, with the one who was crucified and died on a cross and laid in a tomb and then rose from the dead and now reveals himself as a risen Christ to his apostles. He reveals himself as we see in everyday life. How often it is that he wants to do the same in our lives. For our first communicants, yes, today you will receive him in the body, blood, soul, and divinity that he's gifted us through the Last Supper and through the Holy Eucharist. But he also wants to encounter you every day. He wants to come to you every day of your life. He wants to come knock on your door. He wants to be in your classrooms with you. He wants to be with you on the playground. He wants to be with you with your families. He wants to reveal himself to you and encounter you in every part of your life. As he does for all of us. So often we have we realize, just like the apostles, that we don't recognize him. It says that the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus at first. And how true it can be in our lives when we're not ready, when we aren't looking for Jesus, then while he reveals himself to us, we often don't recognize him right before us. So, Jesus wants to reveal himself to us in all moments of our lives and encounter us in such a divine intimacy. Now, this gospel story has so much richness. We could spend days on kind of breaking it apart. But there's a few key points I want to make that are very substantial to our Christian life. One of them is is that they encounter him while they're in a boat. While they didn't recognize him at first, they, for John, the, the, the young apostle, the beloved apostle, he calls himself, recognizes Jesus. Remember, John's the one who recognized him first at the tomb. He runs faster, appears, and he saw and believed, and now he's the first one to recognize him again. They're on the seashore of Galilee in the Sea of Tiberias. But they're in a boat, and the boat is significant because it is the boat, if you will, that leads us to Christ. It is the Holy Church. 
This church that we sit in, where you are seated, as you've heard me say before, is called a nave. And that word translated means boat or ship. So if you take the church and flip it upside down, you can see a huge ship, right? Like the hole is above us and you flip it upside down. Now we're on a ship that's leading us to Jesus himself. How wonderful is that? That the apostles experience him in the body of Christ in the church in a boat. And that boat, that body of Christ, that church would help lead them to Christ for all eternity as it does for us as well. We shouldn't miss, too, that part of that ship, that boat, is the sacramental life. Today, five of you receive a new sacrament for the first time of the Holy Eucharist. And that is such an important part of our church. The seven sacraments are what fortify us. They are what sustain us. They are what showers grace upon us so that we might thrive in this life and then, of course, be with God for all eternity. And so the sacraments are coming alive through the ship, through the boat, through the body of Christ as they are present, as He is present to them on that particular day over 2,000 years ago. Remember that it was from His side that the church was formed. On the cross, on the cross of Christ flowed blood and water, the blood of the Holy Eucharist, which you will receive this day for the first time. And the water from the side of Christ representing the waters of baptism, which you received some years ago and were cleansed of your sins and were adopted as beloved sons and beloved daughters of God the Father. That day you were called an adopted child of God. And notice that Jesus, in this story, as he encounters the disciples, calls them children. Children. Have you caught anything to eat? He doesn't say, hey, you ragtag apostles. Hey, you bad fishermen. Hey, you guys. He says, children. Have you caught anything to eat? And that's what he calls each of you. Children. Sons and daughters of God. The Father. And he calls all of us children because as part of the church and baptized, we are children of God himself. So we see this beautiful casting of the net over the right side. He says, they haven't caught anything all night. And he says, cast the net over the right side. There's a great metaphor in that. When we follow Jesus and we do what Jesus asks us, then we are on the right side of things. We We are getting things right, if you will, in our lives. And when they cast the net over the right side, which Jesus asks, when they do His will, there's an abundant catch, bigger than they can hardly haul in in the nets. That's what our lives are meant to be. That's why you receive the Eucharist, so that you can be fortified, so that you can be fed by Jesus Himself, so that your lives are fruitful, so your lives reflect Jesus, so your lives have a big catch, if you will, of all God's grace that He wants to bestow upon you in your life. Now, notice that it was the beloved disciple that claims it is the Lord, but then Peter responds. Peter responds, and he, he does that. He just has such spontaneity, right? Peter just, like, pulls his clothes on and then jumps in the water and starts swimming toward the shore. Most of us probably would start rowing towards the shore, but Peter's so excited to see Jesus that he just jumps in and goes to the shore. I hope that your lives are always like that, that you're so excited to receive the Holy Eucharist, to receive Jesus, that you just want to get to Mass. I can't wait to get to Mass. Mom and Dad, when are we going to Mass this Sunday? And you'll be so excited because you want to get to Jesus, to receive Him in your life. We see that it's when Simon Peter jumped in that there was this humongous catch, 153 as we stated, of large fish. And that's what Jesus wants to do in our lives is give us an abundance of His grace. But this 153 is significant too. St. Augustine says that the 153 fish represent all of the species of fish that were in the Sea of Galilee, in the Sea of Tiberias, where they were fishing. Now imagine if you could catch every single species of fish in one big ocean or lake at one time. How wonderful that would be. Well, what does St. Augustine say that represents for us? It means that it's all people of all times and places, of every nationality and country that have lived before us and will come after us, and all people today. That's what Jesus wants to catch. He wants to bring all people to himself, all people to be in divine intimacy with him. Now, Jesus does something just so beautifully graceful. He says, come on over here now and have a meal with me. Come have breakfast. Come here. He invites them to a meal. 
If you've ever had a meal with somebody that you love very much, which I'm sure is all of us, there's an intimacy in that meal. Maybe it's at Christmas or Easter where families gather together and there's an intimacy. We might even say a divine intimacy around the dinner table. If you've had a meal with friends and you invited over for, say, a birthday party, there's an intimacy with that fr- those friends that you invite. We've all been there before where there's this great intimacy in the gathering around the meal that's provided. Well, today, five of you receive for the first time the greatest meal that you'll ever receive on this earth, and that is the Holy Eucharist. There's great intimacy in that. Jesus himself gives himself to you, gives himself to us in that great meal. It's in the breaking of the bread that he's revealed, as we know from on the road to Emmaus, where he reveals himself to Cleopas and his companion. And now he reveals himself most fully in the breaking of the bread on the sea of the shore of Galilee. And now here, this day, 2,000 years later, at this holy table in the Holy Eucharist. Now, the short version of this gospel would end right there. But we don't want to end there because there's a richness to the rest of this gospel story that we've just reflected on. The richness is now a very personal encounter with Peter himself. Now, note that there's a charcoal fire. Why is this important? This very fine detail. Because there's only two times in the gospel that there's a charcoal fire. One is when Jesus encounters Peter on the way to the cross. And Peter's kind of getting warm around the fire. And people ask him if he knows Jesus. And what does Peter do? He denies him. He says, I don't know the man. He denies Jesus three times. But now around the charcoal fire, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me three times? Do you love me three times over kind of redeeming Peter back into full communion with him? So while Jesus, or Peter denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed, now there's a reconciliation with Jesus. Remember, Peter went off and wept. He cried because he denied Jesus. And then he was reconciled with him. He came back. Last night, my brothers and sisters, right here in the church, our five first communicants had that same encounter with Jesus. They were reconciled with him. They received their first confession with Jesus. And if you will, Jesus saying that I love you to that response is an absolution of sins. Right? In in this gospel story. And last night, our five first communicants were absolved of their sins and that great reconciliation, that great union with God. Peter's response when asked if he loves him three times, You know I love you, Lord. And it's what we all cry out today when we receive the Lord. You know that I love you, Lord. And Jesus says not end there. He says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my flock. He invites us then to go forth and do something very special in our lives. And that is to be himself, to be like Christ. So, Holy First Communicants, I have an invitation for each of the five of you. Are you ready for this? Now that you're going to receive Jesus today, you're going to become more like him. And what does it mean to become more like Jesus? But now you're going to kind of exude Jesus in the world, in your families, in your friendships. You're going to reflect Jesus in your life. That means all day today, you're going to be like little angels reflecting Jesus. Mom and dad say um, something to do, and you're going to say, yes, mom, yes, dad, because you want to look like Jesus. You want to act like Jesus. And then tomorrow, maybe mom and dad will have to remind you. They might have to say, remember, you're supposed to be more like Jesus. You're welcome, parents. And this is what we do. We keep receiving and becoming more like Him. And then we go forth to be like Him in the world. And when we fall short, we reconcile with Him, as did Peter. What a beautiful gospel on a day of the First Communion and on a day of baptisms. Because today as we receive is to become adopted sons of God our Father. This beautiful kind of sacramental love that Christ extended to his apostles. And that day on the sea of the shore of Galilee is extended in divine intimacy to these children and to their families who bring them today to the Holy Church to become adopted sons of God our Father. We are all called 
into this divine intimacy over and over again. My brothers and sisters, this week, let us all do some Lexio Divina with this gospel story and place ourselves in it. Where are you in this story? Are you the one that needs reconciled? Then run to the confession to be reconciled. Are you the one that needs to be fed more fully? Then run to Jesus to be fed. Are you the one that doesn't believe you're a children of God, child of God? Then, then reclaim that baptismal call. If you're on fire for the Lord, then go forth as Jesus has called his disciples to go. Come follow me and then go make disciples and go forth and make disciples. What a beautiful gift we've all been given to become more like Christ through the Holy Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of whom we receive this day.